So what is buprenorphine? Like all forms of opioid agonist treatment, buprenorphine is a long-acting opioid. It's synthetic, meaning it's man-made, and as it's long-acting, it can control opioid withdrawal symptoms for over 24 hours. What's unique about it is that it's a partial agonist with high affinity. And we will see how these two properties have significant clinical consequences, both good and not so good. Why is morphine uh, considered first line? Well, it's as effective as methadone, which we'll talk about later, and has significantly less drug-drug interactions, less, significantly less risk of QT prolongation, uh, reduced rate, uh, reduced risk of respiratory depression, and a uh, reduced overall side effect profile. Uh, in ad addition, um, if when tapering from buprenorphine, it has uh, less of a less withdrawal symptoms compared to methadone. Now, in Canada, essentially all buprenorphine formulations indicated for the treatment of opioid use disorder are always combined with another drug called naloxone. This was done to reduce the potential for misuse because naloxone is an opioid antagonist, meaning that if buprenorphine naloxone happens to be abused um, in a way crushed and injected or snorted internasally, the naloxone component will be absorbed and will cause an unpleasant, uh, unpleasant withdrawal symptoms. So it acts as a deterrent. But if the individual patient takes the medication as prescribed, which is sublingually, meaning under the tongue, the naloxone will have no effect uh, because it has very poor bioavailability orally and sublingually. Hence, the active or therapeutic component of this combination drug is simply buprenorphine. Please note that naloxone, which is a rapid acting antagonist that is also used to reverse opioid overdoses, is not the same as naltrexone, which is a longer acting antagonist. This is usually used for alcohol use disorder as an anti-craving medicine. It tends not to be used for opioid use disorder in Canada. So the dosage forms for buprenorphine and naloxone vary and it depends on the manufacturers. Here you will see some of the formulations available. You can see that the first number denotes the dose of buprenorphine, which is really what we care about. And the second number indicates a naloxone component. And you can see they're all in a four to one ratio. As I mentioned before, Buprenorphine is a partial agonist with high affinity. What does partial agonist? What does a partial agonist mean? What this it, what it means is that when buprenorphine binds to the opioid receptor, it doesn't activate the receptor completely, resulting in lower intrinsic activity. This is we believe responsible for buprenorphine's ceiling effect which we will talk about in the next slide. Buprenorphine also has high affinity. What this means is that buprenorphine really loves the opioid receptor, specifically the mu receptor. What this means is that it will come in and kick out any other opioid on the receptor. This is both good in that it will dissociate slowly from the receptor, which contributes to long acting effects, but it's also bad because it can cause something called precipitated withdrawal, which we will also talk about.
Now, as I mentioned in the previous slide, the fact that buprenorphine is a partial agonist gives us significant clinical benefit. Because unlike full agonists, such as heroin, morphine, or methadone, um, buprenorphine will reach a ceiling effect, meaning that after a certain amount of, uh, after a certain dose, it doesn't matter how much more buprenorphine you add, you're eventually going to reach a ceiling. And this ceiling is ideally less than the threshold for respiratory depression, which is what we're trying to avoid. As opposed to a full agonist, if you give enough of, for example, heroin, eventually you are going to have a patient that's going to be in respiratory depression, meaning he's going to reduce his respiratory rate and eventually stop breathing and die. Now, buprenorphine, right, can still cause this, but the, over, the respiratory depression tends to be uh, present if other sedatives or central nervous system depressants are added on. So this is, for example, benzodiazepines or alcohol. Now, let's talk about the consequences of buprenorphine's high affinity. If so, an individual has in the first, recently consumed um, a full little, uh, image here, a full, you see uh, an individual uh, that for example, is fentanyl, addicted, heroin, and dependent morphine. to opioids. You can see However, in the first diagram some reason that they for example, don't have an opioid it's system nicely and bound withdrawal. to so they're not the too happy. opioid receptor. This is actually Perfect time if you were to introduce, introduce buprenorphine, buprenorphine at this time, this is because, because the buprenorphine, buprenorphine has come in very I mean, it really lost and the receptor. Will it's going to come in, uh, and the individual. The goal is to have the patient feel normal, so not in withdrawal, but also not intoxicated. Receptors. Now, as mentioned before, right, buprenorphine is a partial agonist, meaning that it's, it's only partially activates the receptor. So you can imagine, right, suddenly all this buprenorphine comes in and kicks out all these, uh, these uh, full agonists, right? The individual is going to interpret this as a very severe withdrawal because you're going from full activation to suddenly partial activation. So patients are going to have very severe opioid withdrawal symptoms. They may and probably will stop treatment, right? And this is obviously not, not good. Now, 
this is not deadly. Usually it's not dangerous for an average individual, um, but it can be very unpleasant. The only time that uh, opioid withdrawal is uh, very severe is um, one of the only times is if an individual uh, were pregnant, right? It can be very dangerous to the fetus. Now, buprenorphine treatment can be divided into three phases. One is induction, then stabilization, and then maintenance. I also want to note that there are various protocols for inducing a patient on buprenorphine and naloxone in each very slightly. Now, before we talk about the actual induction process, we all of this is, is essentially pointless, right, if the patient is not consuming the medication as directed. So as mentioned before, buprenorphine comes in sublingual tablets. They have to be placed under the tongue and completely dissolved. This can take from two to 10 minutes. They should not be swallowed and uh, they should avoid any food or drink until the tablets are completely dissolved. Because if you swallow them, right, it's not, it's not going, it's not going to be a bit bioavailable, right? It's not going to really have any effect. Now, let's talk about the induction process. As I mentioned before, our goal is to avoid precipitated withdrawal. So, we want to wait until the patient is experiencing mild to moderate opioid withdrawal. If done, if done appropriately, buprenorphine's partial agonist effect will be experienced as relieving withdrawal, not causing it. Generally, Individuals who consume short-acting opioids, such as heroin or illicit fentanyl, need to generally wait from uh, anywhere from 12 to 16 hours since their last dose um, in order to be in sufficient withdrawal to take their first dose of buprenorphine. Individuals with uh, intermediate-acting opioids, such as controlled-release hydromorphone, generally need to wait 17 to 24 hours since their last dose. And individuals consuming long-acting opioids such as methadone need to wait around 30 to 48, 48 hours, sometimes even 72 hours, right? So this, is, this has made it very challenging to transition individuals from methadone to buprenorphine. However, there is a new method, uh, a new protocol which um, hopefully avoids this. And we will talk about this towards the end of the slides. can we do to objectively determine when it's safe to start induction? Well, um, we, you, most practitioners tend to use something called a COWS score. COWS stands for Clinical Opioid Withdrawal Scale. It's based on patient history and physical exam findings. Generally, a COWS score of greater than 12, so it's 13 or above, usually indicates sufficient withdrawal to start um, uh, induction of buprenorphine.
Now, what is the initial dose, right? So again, this varies by guidelines. Um, but generally, once a patient is in appropriate withdrawal, you would provide them with a four milligram dose of buprenorphine. Then additional doses ranging from two to four milligrams can be provided to the patient as required for any opioid withdrawal symptoms. And you can provide these doses every one to three hours. The goal is that the patient, um, and this can continue up to a up to a maximum of 12 milligrams on day one or less, because some patients may be able to have their opioid withdrawal symptoms managed at significantly lower doses. So let's continue on with Alex. After a thorough discussion, Alex has decided Now, what is the initial dose, right? So again, this varies by guidelines, um, but generally, once a patient is in appropriate withdrawal, you would provide them with a four milligram dose of buprenorphine. Then additional doses ranging from two to four milligrams can be provided to the patient as required for any opioid withdrawal symptoms. And you can provide these doses every one to three hours. The goal is that the patient, um, and this can continue up to a up to a maximum of 12 milligrams on day one or less, because some patients may be able to have their opioid withdrawal symptoms managed at significantly lower doses. So let's continue on with Alex. After a thorough discussion, Alex has decided to start opioid agonist treatment with buprenorphine naloxone. His last fentanyl consumption was 12 hours ago. His cow score is 20. A prescription of four milligrams of buprenorphine naloxone was faxed to the pharmacy downstairs. Alex is instructed by the physician to go to the pharmacy and have his first four milligrams of buprenorphine naloxone. The pharmacist is aware that this is the first time Alex is on this medication and counsels the patient on how to consume the medication appropriately. The dose is observed by the pharmacist and the pharmacist documents this. So let's continue on with Alex. After a thorough discussion, Alex has decided to Now, what? So let's continue on with Alex. After a thorough discussion, Alex has decided to start opioid agonist treatment with buprenorphine naloxone. His last fentanyl consumption was 12 hours ago. His cow score is 20. A prescription of four milligrams of buprenorphine naloxone was faxed to the pharmacy downstairs.
Alex is instructed by the physician to go to the pharmacy and have his first four milligrams of buprenorphine naloxone. The pharmacist is aware that this is the first time Alex is on this medication and counsels the patient on how to consume the medication appropriately. The dose is observed by the pharmacist and the pharmacist documents this. Three hours later, Alex returns to see the physician for reassessment. Another four milligram dose is prescribed to Alex due to ongoing opioid withdrawal symptoms. Alex was asked to return to clinic in another three hours. He does so, and another four milligrams is prescribed because he's still having some withdrawal. Now he's reached a 12 milligram maximum on day one. So he's then asked to return the next day for reassessment. Now it's day two. What the, clinic, what the physician does is add up the total day one dose required and consolidate it to one's daily dosing. So if the patient was ma managed with eight milligrams, right? That's great. Day two dose is gonna be eight milligrams all at once. However, in our case, right, you can see that Alex required all, it required 12 milligrams, which is the day one maximum, right? So he comes in on day two, um, and uh, if the day one dose, right, did not control the opioid withdrawal symptoms, then you can actually increase the dose by up to four milligrams. So the total day two dose can actually be up to 16 milligrams. Now, just important to note that after day one, buprenorphine doses should be consolidated to one's daily doses right? Because buprenorphine is a long half-life, um, uh, greater than 20, uh, it, the effects should last ideally 24 hours or more. Then the next step is we enter into phase two, which is a stabilization phase. This is where we fine tune the buprenorphine dose. On following days, if withdrawal symptoms, cravings, or illicit opioid use persists, you, can con uh, you will continue with dose increases, around two to four milligrams per day. The target dose is generally 12 to 16 milligrams of buprenorphine per day by the end of the first uh, week. Uh, the maximum single daily dose in Canada is 24 milligrams. Now, the cool thing about buprenorphine is that theoretically you could see them every day for reassessment and you can increase the dose daily. So it's, it's, you get them up to, um, a, a, up to a pretty adequate dose, right? Um, pretty, pretty fast. The goals, right, are to find a dose that prevents opioid withdrawal symptoms, reduces or stops opioid cravings, and decreases or stops the use of self-administered opioids or illicit opioids. Phase three is the maintenance phase. This then the next step is we enter into phase two, which is a stabilization phase. This is where we fine tune the buprenorphine dose. On following days, if withdrawal symptoms, cravings, or illicit opioid use persists, you, can con uh, you will continue with dose increases, around two to four milligrams per day. The target dose is generally 12 to 16 milligrams of buprenorphine per day by the end of the first uh, week. Uh, the maximum single daily dose in Canada is 24 milligrams. 
Now, the cool thing about buprenorphine is that theoretically you could see them every day for reassessment and you can increase the dose daily. So it's, it's, you can get them up to, um, a, a, up to a pretty adequate dose, right? Um, pretty, pretty fast. The goals, right, are to find a dose that prevents opioid withdrawal symptoms, reduces or stops opioid cravings, and decreases or stop the use of self-administered opioids or illicit opioids. Phase three is the maintenance phase. This phase starts once the buprenorphine dose is stable. The duration is can last from months to years to up to a lifetime. This is when the patient will build uh, or start earning take-home doses. The physician will determine, based on clinical stability, how many carries, if any, are appropriate. In Ontario, unlike methadone, there's no regulated care rules, so there's no maximum amount of regular take-home doses. Generally, right, uh, my patients uh, will get one to two weeks worth of carries, but the very stable patients will get uh, up to four weeks at a time. And the way they build carries is they don't get the carries all at once, right? They start off by going every day to the pharmacy. They're on the, uh, you stabilize them on buprenorphine, right? Uh, and then once they start having clear urines, uh, uh, no substance, uh, no problematic substance use, you can start giving them one carry. So meaning they can stay home one day of the week and have their dose at home. And eventually you build up and you earn more and more. Now, there are some alternate dosing arrangements you may come across. Because buprenorphine is very long acting, um, you can actually get away for some, with some patients with less than daily dosing. So uh, some patients can have their dose dispensed every other day at twice the titrated daily dose, meaning that you still need to start off with uh, daily dosing, but say your patient is stabilized in eight milligrams per day, you can actually try dispensing double that, so 16 milligrams every other day. Now, the caveat is that the, mat, uh, the total daily dose should not exceed 24 milligrams. Some patients are actually able to get away with uh, uh, dosing three times a week. Uh, again, same caveat, no more than 24 milligrams each day, which means that um, the patient needs to be stabilized on eight milligrams or less per 
dosing arrangements you may come across. Because buprenorphine is very long acting, um, you can actually get away for, with some patients with less than daily dosing. So uh, some patients can have their dose dispensed every other day at twice the titrated daily dose, meaning that you still need to start off with uh, daily dosing, but say your patient is stabilized in eight milligrams per day, you can actually try dispensing double that, so 16 milligrams every other day. Now, the caveat is that the, mat, uh, the total daily dose should not exceed 24 milligrams. Some patients are actually able to get away with uh, uh, dosing three times a week. Uh, again, same caveat, no more than 24 milligrams each day, which means that um, now there are some alternate dosing arrangements you may come across. Because buprenorphine is very long acting, um, you can actually get away for some, with some patients with less than daily dosing. So uh, some patients can have their dose dispensed every other day at twice the titrated daily dose, meaning that you still need to start off with uh, daily dosing, but say your patient is stabilized in eight milligrams per day, you can actually try dispensing double that, so 16 milligrams every other day. Now, the caveat is that the, mat, uh, the total daily dose should not exceed 24 milligrams. Some patients are actually able to get away with uh, uh, dosing three times a week. Uh, again, same caveat, no more than 24 milligrams each day, which means that um, the patient needs to be stabilized on eight milligrams or less per day. Otherwise, they wouldn't be able, uh, eligible for this uh, dosing arrangement. And apparently, the efficacy appears to be maintained with these dosing schedules, which is really great. Now, what do we do with missed doses? Due to buprenorphine's partial agonist properties, retriting a patient, retitrating a patient's buprenorphine dose after missing uh, doses does not require the same degree of vigilance as methadone. However, missed doses can contribute to a loss of tolerance to buprenorphine. So generally, right, if six or more consecutive daily doses of buprenorphine are missed, the prescription should be canceled by the pharmacist and the patient should be directed to the physician for a reassessment as likely they will need to be restabilized. So it's very important that you always, the pharmacist always inform the prescriber of any missed doses. So we talked about uh, now what do we do with missed doses? Due to buprenorphine's partial agonist properties, retriting a patient, retitrating a patient's buprenorphine dose after missing a dose as methadone. However, missed doses can contribute to a loss of tolerance to buprenorphine. So generally, right, if six or more consecutive daily doses of buprenorphine are missed, the prescription should be canceled by the pharmacist and the patient should be directed to the physician for a reassessment as likely they will need to be restabilized. So it's very important that you always, the pharmacist always inform the prescriber of any missed doses. So we talked about uh, Alex's day one induction. So now this is day two. So he returns the following day. And keep in mind that Alex on day one uh, required the entire 12 milligrams. So he comes in on day two. Um, and he says that the 12 milligrams is controlling his opioid withdrawal symptoms and cravings. And he denies any illicit opioid use. So he seems, on day two, he seems okay on 12 milligrams. However, right, you continue to see Alex weekly, if not more frequently, and eventually, right, you, you increase his dose a bit, and he appears to be stabilized on a dose of 16 milligrams. He continues to recover, eventually earns his first carry, 
which is great. Now let's talk about the second line form of opioid agonist treatment, methadone. Now let's go back to Alex. So eventually, and unfortunately, this happens very frequently, Alex was lost to follow up. One day he returns to clinic and sees the addiction medicine physician. He tells the physician that after a fight with his parents, he stopped taking his buprenorphine. He then relapsed the fentanyl. However, he is now consuming fentanyl intravenously. Keep in mind before he was smoking it. He has recently consumed fentanyl and is not in withdrawal. He tells you that he does not want to go into opiate withdrawal and is asking to be started on methadone. Now, methadone uh, has actually been around for quite some time. It was developed in Germany during World War II as a pain medicine. It became popular in the treatment of heroin addiction in the 1960s. And it was actually a Canadian researcher, Dr. Halliday from Vancouver, who's believed to set up the first methadone program in the world. Methadone is a full new opioid receptor agonist as opposed to buprenorphine, which is partial. Uh, now, methadone uh, has actually been around for quite some time. It was developed in Germany during World War II as a pain medicine. It became popular in the treatment of heroin addiction in the 1960s. And it was actually a Canadian researcher, Dr. Halliday from Vancouver, who's believed to set up the first methadone program in the world. Methadone is a full new opioid receptor agonist, as opposed to buprenorphine, which is partial. Uh, methadone has very good oral absorption, high systemic bioavailability, and a long duration of action, which is necessary for any form of OAT. The elimination half-life is greater than 24 hours. So once daily dosing uh, should ideally prevent opioid withdrawal symptoms. However, the pain relieving effects are shorter acting, so six to eight hours. And methadone is metabolized primarily by the liver and primarily by the P450 enzyme system. Now, methadone has been uh, shown to reduce morbidity and mortality associated with heroin addiction, shown to reduce and prevent opioid withdrawal and cravings, block the euphoric effect of exogenous opioids, reduce heroin use, decrease the risk of HIV infection, and also been shown to, uh, to reduce use of other illicit substances, including cocaine, amphetamine, and sedatives. However, there are multiple safety issues, and it is very highly regulated, including in Ontario. 